we had a game tree. And now we say that this is the extensive form game. But every extensive form game can be represented as a normal form game. So each game of this type can be represented as a table. But in order to make a correct um, transformation, we should make sure that we specified strategies correctly. Mm -hmm. And strategy of a player is a specification of his actions at each of the decision nodes. In this game, we have two decision nodes for the second player. Mm -hmm. Therefore, each of his strategies should have two actions. Mm -hmm. And we make permutations of all possible, um, all possible uh, actions. And then, if we have two decision nodes, two possible actions at each of decision nodes, we have four strategies. Now, when we came up with normal form representation, a natural step would be to apply a solution concept that we already know. If we have a table, we apply Nash equilibrium. Mm -hmm. How we do that? Say, we now reason from the perspective of player one. Player one decides whether to stay out or enter the market. And each time, I want to find my best response to the strategy of my opponent. Mm -hmm. Say player two decides to utilize his first strategy. Then player one has to find his best, respond, best response. Therefore, I look at first numbers, mm -hmm. because I am now in the shoes of player one. If player two plays profit, profit, then I choose between 0 and 540. This one is better. I put the star here. Mm -hmm. If player 2 plays his second strategy, player 1 decides between 0 and loss. Mm -hmm. Then this is better for him. This is the best response. Uh, move further. Player 2 plays his third strategy. Player 1 decides between 0 and 540. Again, this is best response. In this case, what is best response? Yes, to stay out. Now, I change the thing other way around. Now, I put on shoes of player two. Now, I want to find best responses of player two to each of the strategies of player one. Say, I know that player one will play stay out. What is my best response then. Now I look at these second uh, numbers. Mm -hmm. So it can be either this or this. Yeah? They are equal, therefore I put two stars here. If player one enters the market, uh, the player two has to decide between 540 and 264 minus epsilon. Mm -hmm. Therefore I put stars in these two things, because they are, again, equal. And then how I found Nash equilibrium? Nash equilibrium, this is the strategy profile when both players are best responding to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have to find outcomes where I have two stars. This is this one, this one, and this one. So Nash equilibrium concept gave me three solutions to the game. Mm -hmm. How can we check whether it is indeed uh, an Nash equilibrium? Well, we again uh, recall the definition of Nash equilibrium. This is a strategy profile when none of the players has an incentive to deviate given the strategy of the opponent. Mm -hmm. Say I take this outcome. Does player two has an incentive to deviate? No. If player one plays stay out, then whatever player two does, he will only be worse off. Yeah? So this is indeed an equilibrium. And you can check this in each of the places. But look now what happens. I say that 
For example, this equilibrium. Uh, in my first decision node, I will get um, stay out. Huh? Then I say it will be profit maximization, and then it will be limit pricing. If I go back to the tree, and if I try to highlight the edges, the, I will highlight this one, uh, this one, and this one. Mm -hmm. And look now on the logic of this game. In a way, my monopolist tells to the um, potential entrant, look, if you decide to enter, I will play limit pricing, and you will have losses. So uh, the mon monopolist, he threatens the entrant. Don't do that, because you will be punished. You will get losses. But the problem is that entrant, he also knows this game. He looks at it and says, OK, come on, guy. This is not a credible threat. You will never do that. Because if you play limit pricing, uh, you lose it also. You are better off by playing profit maximizing. So just I don't believe in this threat. And therefore, we as analysts, we don't believe into this equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Because this is something wrong with this equilibrium. And actually, if we look um, at this one with this limit up there, so it will be like um, this edge, no, this edge, this, and this. Again, this is something wrong. This guy will never play this limit price just because profit maximizing is better to him. Mm -hmm. um, when we applied backward inductions, we got this outcome. Mm -hmm. But if we apply Nash equilibrium concept, we get these two that are sort of defective equilibria. Mm -hmm. And this clearly shows the difference between two solution concepts. So you should understand that Nash equilibrium itself, it's not, how to say, this is not a universal tool. This is one of the solution concepts that points on interesting outcomes of the game. Mm -hmm. So to say, it tells you that Nash equilibrium are the outcomes that are most likely to be played. Mm -hmm. But now we see that in some certain circumstances, this Nash equilibrium it's not helpful. Mm -hmm. It gives me three equilibria, and two of them are wrong. And I have to apply some additional thinking to purify this idea. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in order to purify this idea of Nash equilibrium, I introduce something called backward induction. With this method, I eliminate this defective equilibria. As simple as that. Mm -hmm. So Nash equilibrium. This is a solution concept for normal form games. If you have a game tree, you apply another solution concept that is called subgame perfect equilibrium. Mm -hmm. A good question would be why it is called oh, a subgame perfect. Mm -hmm. The idea is the following that my game tree consists actually of several small subgames. Mm -hmm. So, subgame is a part of game that starts in each of the decision nodes. Mm -hmm. So in this um, initial game, I have three decision nodes. So I forget about the first one. Mm -hmm. I don't look at this. And this here, I have two small games, two sub-games. And the idea is the following, that my sub-game perfect equilibrium should be such that it is equilibrium in each of the sub-games. Mm -hmm. Say. If I consider this subgame, I have to find an equilibrium in a small game. What is the equilibrium here? That I look at these two outcomes, and this is the equilibrium of this small game. Mm -hmm. The same here. This profit maximization is an equilibrium of a subgame. Mm -hmm. So look, if you say take this equilibrium, it tells you that if you are in the second decision node, you have to play limit pricing. But this is not an equilibrium strategy for this small game. Mm -hmm. Therefore, this subgame uh, sub perfection eliminates this equilibrium as such. Mm -hmm. So we don't consider that. And then, look, say, mm, get back to this. So I say that this is decision node 1, 
this is decision node 3, 2 and 3. Now we are clever with you, yeah, and we apply backward induction thinking formally. What we do? First of all, we just forget about this part of the game and this part of a, of a game. We consider only this. For now on, we, can, we assume that this is the whole game and nothing else exists. I want to solve this. This is a decision problem of player two. So he uh, dis decides between these two outcomes. I say that this, is, this outcome is better for the player too. Mm -hmm. Now I consider only this part of the game. This is my new sub-game. Again, I look at these two numbers and this one is better for player two. Mm -hmm. So I found solutions for these two sub-games. What should I do actually now? Instead of writing that here I have a decision node, I can say, well, this is not a decision node anymore. This is, will be just an outcome node. Because uh, as long as I understood that this is a solution for this game, this does not make sense for me anymore. Yeah? I just forget about this outcome. I just erase that. And I put this outcome on this instead of this decision node. And then I raise this as well. And I can do just the same. I know that this will never be played. I forget about that. And instead of decision nodes, here I put the outcome. Mm -hmm. Then I forget this part. And now I have a new small subgame. Mm -hmm. I decide between the two. But now I play uh, as a player one. Therefore, I look at first outcomes. Now I decide between 0 and 540. Mm -hmm. This one, this is the outcome. Mm -hmm. So in here, therefore, instead of decision node, I write this 540, 540. This is how the backward induction works. And this is what is subgame perfect. You just solve small games until you come to the initial node. And then this is a solution. In this way, you can never ever get this defective Nash equilibrium. Mm -hmm. It just makes sure that your equilibrium concept now is purified. Make sense? Yeah. Now I think you should be able to solve any decision tree. Mm -hmm. Okay, a new model. Well, in the previous example, we had a game, what is called a game with perfect information. What does mean a game with perfect information? It means that each of the players know what happened uh, before he came to this decision node. Hmm? So all information is equal, everybody knows the same, and everybody knows what happens along the way. Mm -hmm. So exactly as in the previous game. And now we make an assumption that there is something, myth something missing in the game. For example, um, I'm a potential entrant. I want to enter the market. Well, but I don't know the nature of the monopolist. Say I can assume that there can be two options. Either he can be really strong monopolist and um, he wants, okay, not, not a strong monopolist, a high cost company. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he will always prefer high prices. Or he can be a low cost company and he will prefer a, a, low, uh, a low prices. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what is happening here is that um, 
this is a monopolist, he can decide whether to go for low prices or high prices. But in fact, if I am a high cost company, I would prefer to have high prices, not to have losses. Yeah? And other way around. So now we have um, a game with asymmetric information. The monopolist, he knows his costs. He knows uh, whether I am a low cost company or high cost company. But the potential entrant, he doesn't know that. He has only some probability. I have some estimates. Yeah? Uh, and we introduce this probability raw uh, that tells me what is the probability of each event to occur. And this is what is called a game of incomplete information. Because when the game starts, not all the players know everything about the game. Mm -hmm. In order to complete the structure, I introduce the nature. I say that in the beginning of the game, the nature moves. Mm -hmm. And the nature decides whether the monopolist will be a high cost company or a low cost company. And this uh, move of nature has a probability distribution. Uh, the probability rho that the company has high cost and one minus rho is that the company has low costs. Mm -hmm. um, so now look how the game is actually arranged. It's a little bit different than in the previous case. The nature moves, and then the monopolist decides whether to play low price or high price. First of all, again, look, if I'm a high cost company, I'm always better off playing high price here than playing low price. Mm -hmm. So for him, the high prices are always better than low prices, and other way around in the um, bottom of the tree. Then the potential entrant, he sort of observes the signal on the market, mm -hmm. and then decides whether to enter or to stay out. When the enter occurs, the monopolist can change something. Mm -hmm. Then he can make a decision again, either to play low prices or high prices. So now think that, well, um, the monopolist is a low-cost company. We just look at the bottom of the tree. If we start to apply backward induction thinking, so say I consider this part of the game. Mm -hmm. It looks for me that, OK, I have to consider the second number here. Uh, if I choose between 900 and 850, I choose 900. Here the same, I choose 1200. So low price, low price. Between these two, I choose low price. Between these choose two, I again choose low price. Mm -hmm. Then, if I know that these are the outcomes of these subgames, then I move to this part. Uh, the potential enter, he considers these two digits. Yeah. Here, here, and here. So, in, in this way, um, he understands that it is always better for him to stay out. Huh? And then we get this. This will be the equilibrium path. So, if, say, if we do not consider this part, the nature move. If we assume that the monopolist is a low cost. Hmm? So if you apply this backward induction thinking, you will get this thing. Uh, look at this. In fact, it only means that a low cost monopolist will always play low price. Mm -hmm. For him, this is better off. Now we think, what will happen uh, if we play high costs? If Say, if it turns out that a monopolist is a high-cost company. Look here. Between these two, I choose high price. Between these two, again high price. Between these two, high price, high price. Mm -hmm. Then if the potential enter looks at these outcomes, he is always better off by entering. Mm -hmm. Say here he chooses between 0 and 200. He enters. And here the same, yeah? 200, 0. He enters. So for a high cost company, 
uh, it is always better off to play high price. Mm -hmm. And now uh, we should put on shoes of a monopolist with the high prices. Look at this. He understands that if I play high prices in this decision node, I immediately send a signal that I am a high cost producer. Because if I were low cost, I would never ever play high prices. Yeah? Because for a, high, uh, for a low cost producer, uh, it is not pro profitable. Equilibrium strategy for a low cost producer is always to play low prices. So if potential entrant suddenly observes a high price on the market, this is immediately a signal that your monop the monopolist on the market is a high cost. And if he is a high cost and I enter, I can earn money. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, the high cost monopolist, he has an incentive to try to cheat. Mm -hmm. If he plays low cost here and the entrance stays out, then he can uh, set this high price and earn money, this 850. Mm -hmm. He wants to try. So therefore, we, ha we see that there is sort of a signal in game. Mm -hmm. The decision in this node will send a signal, and decision in this node will define my outcome. If I'm a low cost monopolist, I have no incentive to send any signal like high cost, yeah? always low priced. Um, so what, what is the decision problem for a potential entrant? What to do? Well, I understand that even though I observe a low price, it doesn't mean that I can enter. Mm -hmm. There is still some probability raw that this guy um, is a low cost producer. Mm -hmm. No, or one minus row. And then if I enter, I lose money. Mm -hmm. So what it means for me is that I have to decide as a potential enter. If I absorb this uh, low price, I can either enter and with probability one minus rho, I end up here and I have losses. Mm -hmm. Or with probability raw, I enter, uh, the guy plays high price, and I earn money. Mm -hmm. So my decision problem now depends on my beliefs or my expectations about raw. So with probably my expected profit is equal to raw multiplied by T100 plus 1 minus rho multiplied by 1 minus 150. Mm -hmm. So for now, I have to decide what is my belief, what is my estimate. Um, say what is, what is the break-even point. If I equate this to 0, it looks like rho should be equal to 0.429. Mm -hmm. So if my expectation is that uh, the probability that my monopolist is the high cost producer is higher than 43%, then I should enter the market. Mm -hmm. Because then I will earn positive profit. If I think that this probability is lower, then I stay out. Mm -hmm. Because then I have a negative profit. So you see that in the games of asymmetric information, many oh, okay, the outcome depends on the probability distribution, or I would say even more on the beliefs of the players. Mm -hmm. Now imagine that this rho is equal to 0 0.3. Okay, or if we are more precise, we say that the potential entrant has his estimate of the probability of the monopolist to be a high cost producer equal to 30%. Mm -hmm. Then he, the potential entrant, 
calculates his expected profit. 0 0.3 multiplied by 200 plus 0 0.7 multiplied by minus 150. Uh, and this turns out to be minus 45. Mm -hmm. So if the potential entrant has this belief, he decides to stay out. Mm -hmm. And now imagine that actually the monopolist was a high cost producer. Mm -hmm. So he played low price in the initial stage. Uh, then the entrant stayed out and then he started to play high price. Mm -hmm. So he earned uh, 850. On the other hand, if he played his equilibrium strategy, he could end up here. Mm -hmm. So in this way, he actually earns more than with his equilibrium strategy. Mm -hmm. In a way, this is a limit pricing strategy. Look at this. Yeah? I limit my price on my first stage in order to earn more later on. Mm -hmm. So though uh, with symmetric information, with linear costs, we have got the outcome that limit pricing strategy cannot be applied with asymmetric information, it suddenly becomes possible. Mm -hmm. So do you have any questions regarding this model? Mm -hmm. I think it's more logical than the previous one. Yeah? Like it's very intuitive. Okay, well, um, in fact, uh, this game tree, we build it not to solve the problem, but rather to analyze the problem. Mm -hmm. A game tree gives you an analytical structure. So you assign who does what, in which sequence, what is the outcome, and so on. And then you have a very good structure to analyze the problem. And then what exactly we did. So it doesn't mean that um, we can come to a final solution. That this is what will happen. No. Like potential solutions? We find potential solutions. With this game structure, we understand the incentives of each of players. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here I understand the following. That uh, first of all, the high cost monopolist has an incentive to cheat. He has an incentive to send a signal that he is a low cost, mm -hmm. just to um, increase his potential profit, if the entrant believes him. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we as well understand that now the potential entrant, he decides whether to enter or stay out, depending on his expectation or depending on his belief on the nature of another player. Mm -hmm. So this game, or this tree, gives us a tool how to reason about the whole market situation. So again, even the Nash equilibrium, this is not a 100% security that this is will be what, what happens. Not like that. But Nash equilibrium always points you on something that is interesting. This is that is most likely to happen. In real life, people say, people play a game, they can simply don't understand the rules. That's why we will not come to the Nash equilibrium. But suddenly, if we repeat the game one after another many, many times, then people start to understand the rules of the game. Then they start to understand what is the logic. And in the end, it will converge to Nash equilibrium. So Nash equilibrium is a solution concept that points on interesting outcomes. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a concept that helps you to reason about market situation. Any more questions? We have just small prob uh, model left. Mm -hmm. This is called the predatory pricing as an alternative to limit pricing. Before that, um, we discussed a situation when we want to take the action 
before the potential enter occurs. Mm -hmm. So I want to uh, deter the entry. Now I talk about the strategies that can be applied as a response to entry. So the entry has already occurred. And now I have to do something about that. Um, again, the same example. I have an, a monopolist and I have a potential entrant. A monopolist can fight, can fight against the enter. If he fights, he understands that I can have losses. And this is exactly what happens here. So if I operate as a single company on the market, I can earn seven if there is no, uh, no other companies on the market. But if someone enters, I have to decide. If I accommodate this entry, mm -hmm. then we will just split. So instead of seven, I will earn only four. Or I can fight just to show that please don't do that. And then I have losses as well. But the guy has even larger losses. Mm -hmm. We have a simple gain tree. Who will help me to find a solution? What is the sub-game perfect equilibrium of this game? Exactly. This is the first sub-game. Mm -hmm. The second player chooses between minus one and four. He chooses four. This guy, the potential enter, chooses between zero and four. And he chooses four. So this is the only equilibrium path. And this thing is called now an incredible threat. You are threatening me that you will fight? OK. I don't believe. I enter. Mm -hmm. And especially, this is a case if I have a symmetric information. So I know everything about the monopolist. So I have all information about costs. Uh, I know these outcomes. Therefore, if I consider entering, I understand that, OK, he will not go for that. I enter, and we will share the market. Mm -hmm. And um, in a way, if we think about this game in a repeated mode, we can think that probably it makes sense to set up a tough reputation. Mm -hmm. So I can fight the entry in order to build up a reputation that I am a very strong uh, monopolist, uh, just to show all future entrant that it is that I will fight against against you. And there is something called um, mm -hmm, <laughs> chain store paradox. Chain store. Um, this thing was actually uh, described by Reichardt Selton in 1978. Why it is called a paradox? Um, if we imagine a game, a huge game tree, when this game um, repeats from one time period to another time period. So you can imagine that. From here, say, I put again this potential entrant, and then the same game arises again, like that. Um, our common sense tells us that in the beginning, somewhere, we should at least try to build this reputation, yeah. to deter the entry. But if we apply game theoretical thinking, and if we look at this tree and say, I consider the tree of n period. So I have this large n period. Mm -hmm. In order to analyze this game, I have to start from the end, backward induction. Mm -hmm. And imagine that this is a sub game that I consider uh, in the period n. Mm -hmm. The equilibrium of this sub game is this accommodate enter. Huh? This will be uh, sub game perfect to this part of the game. Then I move to n minus 1. Mm -hmm. Already I know that it will be accommodate and enter. Uh, and again, I consider the same situation. And I find a sub game, a perfect equilibrium for this part of the game. And this is again accommodate enter. 
So again, theoretical thinking predicts that even though common sense tells us that um, the monopolist can fight, his equilibrium strategy is always to accommodate. Mm -hmm. this, is why, this is why it is called a paradox. Mm -hmm. So in a symmetric information case, uh, this threat of fighting will never work. The only situation when it can work is the case of asymmetric information. If the potential enter really doesn't know for sure whether he faces a strong um, or a predatory monopolist or a weak, uh, then he can be unsure whether to enter or not. Mm -hmm. Imagine, for example, that there is at least some small probability rho that uh, the monopolist is strong. 2.01. Imagine the following. I am a potential enter. And I have my estimate or my belief that the monopolist will fight. But he just enjoys fighting. He is a very strong one. I enter the market, if, even though, okay, I, I think to myself, there is 99% probability that he is weak, that he will accommodate my entry, mm -hmm. and only 1% chance that he will fight. Of course, I will enter, yeah? I will. And then suddenly, it turns out that he fights, even though I was almost completely sure that he will not, but he fights. Oh my goodness. Then I, st I start to think. And the next guy who will come after me, who will try to enter the market, he will for sure increase his estimate. This raw for the next uh, newcomer will be considerably higher. Yeah? So you see that if we have the asymmetric information case, that even a weak monopolist, if he tries to create a little bit of reputation of a tough guy, he can really considerably deter entry just because this is the story of beliefs. Mm -hmm. And this is a Krebs and Wilson game. They say that if we have uh, a time horizon from 1 to n, or say repeated markets one after another, this is always better off even for a weak monopolist to start with the predator pricing, to start fighting, mm -hmm. just to create this reputation, or to increase these beliefs uh, but the thing is that when he approaches the end of the story, he has no incentives to fight, just because he wants to earn money. Mm -hmm. He is better off by earning this 4 instead of losing minus 1. Mm -hmm. In the beginning of the game, he understands that if I fight and have losses of minus 1 and create this reputation of tough guy, I can earn this 7 if someone stays out. Yeah? So I have a strong incentive. But when I approach the end of the game, I understand that my probability of winning this 7 actually decreases, just because there's just a short time before the, end, the game ends. Therefore, I'm better off by playing Accommodate. OK, at least, at least I can earn this 4. Mm -hmm. So therefore, in its simple mode, it looks like that, that if we have a game of asymmetric information in the beginning, even a weak opponent will play predator pricing. But in the end, it will just uh, erase. And here, there is something that we call mixed strategies. So this is some probabilistic choice, mm -hmm. either to fight or not to fight. You know what? That's it for today. <laughs> so for the next lecture.